welcome Achievers to your Easy Achievers Game Podcast for the week of June 30th, a couple days after my birthday. I'm coming to you, of course, as I always do, through the ether on a very hot Georgia morning. Oh, it's, it seems to just be getting hotter and hotter every day, and it's just a little bit of humidity that makes it even hotter. Now... I'll quickly give you some news. I got these bees uh, for my wife. My wife gifted me bees. Not like bees that make honey or anything. It, it's just bees that... Uh, they're called carpenter bees, I think. I don't I, I don't honestly know what they do. I assume they just pollinate and, and eat stuff. I, 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 don't, I don't even know what they eat. But uh, they're very cool. They're outside my window. They're just kind of chilling. It's very hot. They apparently like the heat, so I'm sure they're happy. They're running around... I put like a little, we put a little bowl of water with some rocks in it so they can get some water if they want. And then there's um, so many flowers around here, so they should get plenty of food if that's what they want, I guess. But thank you so much for joining me today. We have plenty to talk about. Of course, the FCC hearing has happened. There was about five days of just nonstop news. And this is going to be a, a, a completely, incredibly dense episode of the show. We're going to be talking about these hearings. We're going to talk about different things inside of the gaming space in terms of how things are looked at, reacted to. A lot of people took the stance to voice certain opinions or were asked difficult questions that they had to find answers for. And this is going to be very fun and a very enjoyable week. Uh, and especially in terms of the news, as we have so much to mill over, I'm very happy to be able to sit down with you today. But before we start the show, of course, we have not so rapid fire. Data Look Entertainment is shutting down internal game development and shifting to publishing. Development for its next Lord of the Rings game is in development since, or which has been in development since mid 2022, has been halted. This was via Warrior 64. I saw this barely a few hours ago. Uh, uh, good uh i know that sounds mean I, I don't mean it to be mean in the sense that i'm happy people are gonna probably be laid off in these i don't mean that but clearly they didn't have the stuff they were given a huge opportunity and uh, they squandered it so it's hard to be mad when they suffer the consequences i guess uh that game is shockingly bad I, and and it looks terrible it, it, it's all around pretty bad so hopefully they find their footing in publishing and stay away from making games. This is a quick one. Among Us is getting an animated series at CBS. Uh, this is from... Uh, what is this? Bear, uh, variety. Uh, they're going to be made by CBSI Animation Productions in partnership with Inner Sloth, which is the independent game studio behind Among Us, uh, to make a series. Owen Dennis will serve as a creator and executive producer of the project under his overall deal with CBS. That's about all I'll cover here. I'm not an Among Us guy. I don't even know how they'd make a show, but it they, looks like they are just going to have fun with it. Good for them. I don't have anything else to say. Uh, there was a funny one by VGC. Uh, th someone said, um, uh, so <laughs> there was a GameZeries.biz uh, interview with Michael Platko Galutsky. And uh, here's an interesting quote I think everyone's reading. Quote, I actually believe Cyberpunk at launch was way better than what it was received. And even the first reviews were positive. Then it became a cool thing not to like. That went from hero to zero really fast. That was the tough moment. We didn't know what was happening. We knew that the game is great. Yes, we can improve it. Yes, we need to take time to do it. And we need to rebuild some stuff. That took us a lot of time. But I don't believe we were ever broken. We were always like this. Let's do this. End quote. Uh, wow. Uh, I think you got lost in the sauce there, my friend. You are a very important figure over there, of course. Uh, being, let me actually make sure I get his title correctly. A CD Project Rick's VP of PR and Communications. So it's no shocking that you'll see something good about the game, but no, it was not uh good at, at launch. It uh, you couldn't play the game at launch. So I don't know what you're talking about, but of course, he has to say these things like that. He can't be like, yeah, it sucked, right? But uh, it definitely wasn't cool to dislike it, I don't think. It it was just fun to make fun of, I think. Slightly different thing. Niantic is shutting down NBA All World and stopping production on the Marvel World of Heroes game that they're doing. Uh, Niantic uh, effed around and found out, I guess. They grew way too big. 
they took on way too many projects and it looks like they are completely axing an entire studio that they made. So they will be closing their LA studio. This is via their actual official page. Reducing our game platform team, so uh, this is, again, from their actual website. Reducing our game platform team and making additional reductions across the company. As a result, we'll be sunsetting NBA All World and stopping production on Marvel World of Heroes. This means we are laying off all, uh, uh, sorry, we're laying off around 230 Neantics. I guess is who they call themselves. Quite the way to be called when you're being laid off. 230 people. Very sad to hear. Very sad to hear. Neantic completely completely overvalued themselves and ate it uh they say here the answer is straightforward we have allowed our expenses to grow faster than revenue very funny to uh that i shouldn't say funny let me backtrack uh it's not very funny it's it's very common to see this they make a lot of money i'm reminded almost of uh 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 what's an example kind of like tail tall right they sat there and made the same game over and over again, similar to Niantic, kind of making the same thing with different IP. I mean, how many games did have his Niantic made? Of course, they're known for Pokemon Go, which completely changed uh, the world for, what, two or three months? Uh, but let's let's see everything Niantic has made before. And then, uh, well, here we go, Wikipedia, boom. Let's see all their games. So the 2016 is Pokemon Go's launch. 2018, you get Ingress Prime. 2019, you get Harry Potter Wizards Unite. You know, none of those worked out. Harry Potter was was like canned shortly after that. 2021, Pikmin Bloom. 2022, Campfire. 2023, NBA All World. Uh, period. Period. Dot. Monster Hunter Now. And that's all this year. And then Neantic Wafers at some point. Later on. Excuse me? And yeah, I mean that shows goes to show they grew too fast. They got a whole other studio in LA, nonetheless, in um the most expensive place to ever open, and they are living there, hoping for the best. Uh, which I believe they started in San Francisco, right? Where did they start? Company span out of. In, uh, I think I think they started, and now it's secured. But, uh, it's not important, but it just goes to show grew too big, too fast, way too much uh, cost and not enough revenue. Not two things you want to combine each other. We got some data that I wanted to quickly go over. That has nothing to do with the FTC hearing that we're about to get into, but. At an idea at Xbox event. Uh, Microsoft showed off a couple interesting numbers that you can kind of extrapolate a couple things. So console marketplace and they have just a big, it's like a PowerPoint deck presentation thing. And these are a few numbers on it. 21 million plus Xbox series S and X's have been sold. 79 million combined Xbox one and Xbox series S and X. 48% of Series players are new to Xbox. It just seems like they needed some new thing to add there. I don't know why why they did that, I guess, to show off like, oh, you know. Uh, and that's always the, not the rumor, but kind of like the scuttlebutt that they're always more interested in Series S numbers because like that's where they actually want people to buy because digital, it makes them much more money, of course, but beside the point. So you can strap it a little bit here, right? 21 million plus Series S and X uh, combined with the Xbox One, 79 million. So that so you can take out a couple and be like, well, that means around 50-ish million of Xbox One, right? But of course, they are making it very hard to fully do because they're just doing plus. So at least 57 million Xbox Ones, most likely, not most likely, for, for, for sure, counting Xbox One, One S, and One X all together, probably. So they're sitting around probably that 50 million mark ish, of course, completely being blown out by PS4's numbers, which uh, let's double check PS4 sales numbers. 117 million, just as a reminder. So two to one for PS4. And then let's see PS5 numbers. 38.5. So if you combine both series S and X, it isn't that bad. But it's still pretty bad. Embarrassing, some say. Now, of course, I start the show 
with a single question that I ask you at home. What have you been playing? What have you been playing? Now, I have been playing Final Fantasy 16, but not a lot. Not really in terms of the game's quality. The game quality is actually very good. It's a good game. But I found myself kind of gamed out. I played a lot of Zelda and a lot of Diablo recently. So I've kind of been chilling. I've actually been reading some comic books. So this is almost what have you been reading segment. Uh, I'm catching up on the latest Nightwing run. I finished, not finished. I actually went back and restarted because I never finished it all the way through Powers and House of X series for the X-Men comics. Very good read. Very good. Highly recommend that. The, the newest Nightwing is very good too, I think which I will be continuing to read because I want to get to uh, the, I want to be caught up with Nightwing uh, and start reading the, the issues that are coming out. But I'm, I haven't really been playing too much. Final Fantasy 16 is very good. I've been enjoying my time with it. I am kind of waiting for the game to really pop off. I feel like it's, it, I've, it's been building to a point the whole time. I don't, I'm not going to spoil where I am, but I have played about, I will say six hours, maybe a little less than that. Probably four, eh, six, let's say four to six hours. So I've, I've put some time into it, and I'm doing all the side quests and these things as they come. Having a good time. I am waiting for some big thing to happen. I have done the big moment everyone's freaking out about on Twitter and these things, which was very cool. That was that was a very cool moment. And I've, I, 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 you know, I'm not even going to say that. So, again, I'm enjoying my time. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying if, if right now I feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over again I don't have a lot of things to do at my disposal like I feel like I, I, I want more things to be able to do because I, I feel like I'm just hitting X and then every now and then activating some abilities and then every now and then I'll jump in the air and do some stuff and then jump down and hit so waiting to to really feel powerful because I don't feel like incredibly strong when I do anything yet that's it. In a very short, what have you been playing this week? Rumor Roundup. Perfect Dark Reboot is still years away. This is from IGN. So there are internal rumblings from the Initiatives game that they are completely in shambles. Uh, let's read a couple snippets. The Initiative was founded... Okay. In the early days of the project, the, o the overall mood was optimistic, of course, this from IGN. Perfect Dark was an exciting IP that most were thrilled to be working on, first at the initiative, and then at certain affinity when the studio signed into, oh, sorry, signed onto the project in 2019. As with the early development process, much of the initial work consisted of nailing down a clear creative vision for what the game would consist of, and then developing a core gameplay loop that is both supportive of that vision and fun for the player. Studio leadership was fairly clear from early on, that the initiative perfect arc will see a balance of combat and espionage element that would ideally feel feel like playing through a James Bond or Mission Impossible movie. One for one former employee, a woman also expressed French Perfect Dark has some news from IGN that I wanted to quickly read. Sorry, I had to do a quick cut there, so sorry if it's a bit bumbled here, but but let's move into and this is actually a quite deep, deep read. In the IGN article, I'm actually going to point you all to that article if you'd like to really dig deep into Perfect Dark's development within with how it's working with the initiative and these things. But to cut it short, because it is very dense, and I do want you to read that, so I'm not going to tell you everything here. But to quickly add, there's a couple things uh, to point out. And the initiative has had turnover to 11. They can't keep talent, which is a which. Is something we reported on multiple times, I believe, with uh, a couple different news stories that have been popping up that they're just having trouble keeping people, which is a problem with any studio really right now because the the talent pool is very very hard. That's why you see actually a lot of um, uh, poaching. You see a lot of people leaving and going to another studio uh, for much more money, and people are getting paid more and more than they ever have been. And that is also why they've gotten Crystal Dynamics to help them with their project here, as, of course, they had their failing Marvel Avengers game. They were kind of sold away, in quotes. Not really sold in the classical sense, but sold away as in, like, we're going to sell you now for labor to Xbox to help them with this game. Which, you know, it does make a little bit of sex because they used to make Tomb Raider, so, of course, you know, it kind of helps them make this game, but... Oh, excuse me. Mm, my bad. But 
I want to bring this ever to everyone's attention. It's very intriguing. And again, it's very good a deep read. This was written by let's get the name Rebecca Valentine, of course, of course. She's pretty much responsible for any good writing on IGN. This was just pretty much just happened. I just found this. This was two hours ago as, as I'm recording. Uh, Assassin's Creed publisher remaking Black Flag. So, so this is on Kotaku. Ubisoft is doubling down on its most popular franchise. Blah blah. blah. According to two sources familiar with the plans who asked not to be named because they are not authorized to discuss them, a remake of the 2013 cross-gen PS3 Xbox 360 game is still in the earliest stages but will not be complete for at least a few years. A team at Ubisoft Singapore, one of the studios that has led development on the Assassin's Creed franchise evolving Ocean Tech, will be heavily involved in helping to modernize the Caribbean-based sailing game. Uh, of course, a spokesperson for Ubisoft dis- declined to comment, but of course... Be cu- I'll be curious to see how deep this remake of the game is, because I do feel like people still use that willy nilly term remasters, remakes, etc. Uh, I would argue that it doesn't even really need one. I would have accepted a port if I'm being honest, like, a, hey, here's 30 bucks for Black Flag. It's a port. We made it in 4K or whatever, 60 frames, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But if they want to make it prettier and release it in a few years, I'm down for that, too. It's a great it really is a great game. I will stand by that. That is one of the best Assassin's Creed ever made. That's probably my second favorite uh, uh, behind uh, Odyssey. Happy to hear it. I believe that it happened. That is happening. Uh, it doesn't seem like Kotaku would lie. They usually are pretty good when they have a full story to say. Uh, excuse me. Let me make sure no one's dying really quick. OK, it's not important at all. All right, this is the show for the week. Now, this is very dense. You might see some cuts here and there because there I'm going to be talking so much here. So I'll be needing water and I'll be needing drinks because this is going to be a lot. FTC hearings. We got Matt Booty taking to the stand to talk about certain things. We got Bobby Kodak to going to the stand talking about how he hates Game Pass. This, this is really dense. Jim Ryan saying these things. So let's get into it. What I have an interesting email. You're going to be hearing me say interesting email quite a bit here. So this is Matt Booty email. In response to Tim Stewart emailing him. This is on December 17th of 2019. I'm going to read this verbatim. Thanks for sharing a lot to digest here. Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I should give everyone a bit of a background before I jump in. Of course, the FTC hearing has happened. If you are in anywhere near the gaming space, you have heard about it. The FTC is having a hearing to see if they need to grant the FT, uh, the, um, excuse me, a preliminary injunction to the FTC to have a preliminary injunction on the Microsoft Activision Blizzard deal. And it is to see pretty much will this create a negative, a net negative to a consumer and should we block this deal? Now, the important thing is this is different from other places blocking a deal. If this deal gets blocked, it's dead. Probably it goes to the wayside because that would push it to the deadline of July 28th. I want to say I hope I got that right of a deadline in the clause of the agreement that says if it is not done by July 28th, the deal is dead and you pay us $3 billion. That is $3 billion for pretty much nothing. They did nothing. All they did was pay some lawyers and these things to have these things. So they just get $3 billion for free. That's a lot of money. Uh, and uh, Microsoft gets nothing. So let's go in. We'll be going in a bunch of emails, a bunch of little... uh articles in these things so strap in it's gonna be a fun time so again matt booty to tim stewart december 17 2019 remember the a lot of this is going to be 2019 time so this isn't technically a, a snapshot of today's xbox in quotes this all could still be the same or at least similar tactics but we could be looking at a different xbox in theory but four years, although seems like a lot, is not, especially when you're looking at companies who have five, 10, 20, 25 year plans, some 50 to 100 year plans. Some companies go that deep into their planning. By this period, we want X thing done, right? That's not crazy for a lot of these companies. So four years, not not a lot of time for massive corporations. 
All right, he says, thanks for sharing. A lot to data share. We'll read in detail. A different view to the general view below might be that we in uh, in ellipses, Microsoft are in a very unique position to be able, or parentheses, sorry, are in a very unique position to be able to go spend Sony out of the business. If we think that video game content matters in 10 years, we might look back and say, quote, totally would have been worth it to lose $2 billion or $3 billion in 2020 to avoid a situation where Tencent, Google, Amazon, or even Sony have become the Disney of games and own most of the valuable content. For example, it is practically impossible for anyone to start a new video streaming service at scale at this point. What content do you base it on? Things like Hulu and CBS All Aspects will be trivial players in the space. In games, Google is three to four years away from being able to have a studio up and running. Amazon was, has shown no ability to execute on game content. Content is the one moat that we have in terms of a catalog that runs on certain devices and capability to create new. Sony is really the only other player who can compete with Game Pass, and we have a two-year and 10 million sub lead. If we reverse course on day and date, it's going to be hard to convince folks that things like Mixer or xCloud have much of a chance of surviving scrutiny either. Very funny, he brings up Mixer. Mixer is long dead uh, by this time, of course, uh, 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 for us, but that time Mixer was still alive and well. Uh, uh, well is, uh, I guess, <laughs> uh, a selective term there, but xCloud, of course, is still going on. There's a lot to really piece apart here. I think as he says a lot of things that are very, very correct, right? You can see at a point, and there's almost an assumption of, and that's probably what Tim Stewart was talking about originally. There's almost an assumption of like, this is the future of, like Game Pass is the future. This is what's going to happen. So, and by the way, a very interesting thing is 10 million sub lead. So uh, that tells you by 2019, they had 10 million subscribers, which I believe we wouldn't have known at that time because I don't think they told us how many subscribers until they had 15 million or something. I don't know. Not important. But this tells us a lot, right? Let's go into things like Hulu and CBS will be trivial for players in this in the space. In games, Google is three to four ways. And of course, Google at that time is still doing Stadia and going to really open that up with with studios and content which of course is dead in very very uh, small time frame. Amazon still is kind of where Amazon is although they have Luna going so it's kind of still in the market but kind of not they're making games right they they've made some popular games but they're still kind of not in the market so it is always interesting to see how far they are thinking out hey so we can't find ourselves in a position that we have let someone else become the Disney right and that is a very apt comparison, I believe, especially when you talk about the games industry as a whole and you talk about something versus to a movie industry or thing things. If someone becomes the Disney, they are the ones calling shots. That is that is a famous thing. If Disney pretty much whole handedly controls the theater market, uh, they have way too many movies and way in general, way too much revenue for movie markets and and these random uh, movie theaters for them to not have their way 100 percent of the time. They dictate the reality. So they are able to literally manipulate the market that they're in and just and we're just talking about theaters. We're not talking about the other major, major things that Disney does. We're just talking about just that. So if you find yourself in a position where you can cut a possibility of someone becoming a Disney in your market, that is very, uh, in a, that is a very interesting thing to see. And it is funny that back then Microsoft was was having to. And I always try to bring this up when you see these little random things that maybe Sony and Microsoft do, you know, they buy this, they buy that. You have to remember they're buying them to make sure no one else buys them partly too. There's a lot of these things that have to make sense when you really have to think about from the, from the million mile point that both Xbox and Sony have over the market, right? They have to look and be like, we can't let an Apple Google come in and get this thing. That might be a lot and there's a little bit more that we'll talk about here about why Xbox is buying Xbox and why Xbox bought Bethesda, or sorry, why, why Xbox is buying Activision and, and why Xbox bought Bethesda. 
they say a couple things, but it's important to remember that they have to make sure that a lot of these things don't come to pass. They need to make sure Tencent doesn't come in and completely with a foul swoop over a, over, over a five year span by three of the five major publishers and own them and are now in major control of the entire industry. And it's interesting that we get that kind of look into the thought process at Xbox. Let's move on because there is literally so much to talk about. Now, this was... <laughs> How do I put this? This was pretty bad. Uh, and really kind of shows what's going on with Microsoft in terms of they are just not there on knowing what to do organically, so they have to buy things. And as a f person who is a fan of Xbox, it was actually very sad to see a lot of this stuff. It was very sad to, to read that they have a whole, they had a whole list of devs to watch, and it's like two pages long, and, and it has all these names on it that, ju that just shows that they're just like have an open wallet, and they're just trying to... Like the previous thing said, uh, and, and a reason I didn't get into it then because it leads into much better now is they want to spend Sony out of the business. That's obvious what they were doing back uh, back then or at least gearing up to do. And look at them now. They're trying to buy Activision, which uh, could lead them to one day be able to spend Sony out of the business. All they need, all Sony needs is a couple bad fiscal years and maybe they're out of the back foot or something. And before I um, uh, just keep spouting, let, let's talk about a lot of these acquisitions. So they had a developers to watch. This was back in 2019, I believe, this original page that I'm looking at. So let's talk about this. A44. They are uh, it's about 70 people. Those are the people behind Ashen and Salt Pepper. Uh, they also have core and comp core competences, which is pretty much like, you know, what, like, what do they do good? Bonfire Studios, they're known for Project Torch, around 30 people. Of course, these are outdated numbers, just as a reminder. This is very old information. People and Ideas, Live Ops, Counterplay Games, Godfall, and Throne Master. Jesus. Uh, these for People and Ideas as well. Dreamhaven. This is, uh, they have not made a game yet, and I believe still have not made a game. Let's quickly check on that. Apologies, Dreamhaven. Yeah, because they know, they, oh, no, no, no. So they they own two studios. I, see, I forgot they even, I forgot, I completely forgot about them. So the Dreamhaven Studios has Secret Door and Moonshot Studio, Moonshot Games. So they're publisher. Interesting, okay. I won't spend too much time on this. They actually look really cool. But they were looking into Dreamhaven. Ember Labs, of course, made Kenna Bridge of Spirits. Face Punch Studios, they are behind Rust. That's around 36 people who made that. Ember Labs, around 28. Fat Shark, 120 people. They're uh, behind Vermintide 1 and 2. for, uh, And they said steady flow, of course. Probably meaning like they have a steady flow of releases. So they're dependable, I guess. Ghost Ship Games. These are Deep Rock Galactic. There's only around 20 people that work there. Very big game for what it is, too. People and ideas slash new audiences. You know, they don't really. Deep Rock Galactic is a very unique game. Haze Light Studios. This has been a very. This would have been very interesting. Size of around 65 people. They, of course, make a way out and it takes two. Uh, people and ideas slash a new audience. Heart Machine. They're behind Solar Ash and Hyper Light Drifter. Hello Games, they're around 26 people. Uh, of course, they're No Man's Sky and Joan Danger. Of course, they would want them for No Man's Sky. That's all they care about. Moon Studios for Ori and Forsaken. Um, Munfish, Atomic Heart, which that fell on his face, didn't it? They're around 39 people. Proletariat, they made Spellbreak. That's around 60. Uh, I don't, they they took down Spellbreak. Is Proletariat still a thing? Yeah, they are there. Striking Distance, of course, Callista Protocol, 150. What if they regret some of these or don't regret some? You know, it's always interesting. And then Team Cherry, they made they make Hollow Knight. Of course, making Hollow Knight still salt right now. 
these are all on their developers to watch. These are people who they wanted or interested to buy. Now, in 2021, they had a final watch list of just kind of the biggest people to look at. And uh, this is for a potential watch list for their Xbox Game Studios. So they have two different gaps that they pretty much identified and were saying these are the people to fit, fit the gaps in our uh, studios, pretty much. So audience expansion is the first gap, and there's five companies involved in that. Thunderful, and their asset is exper expertise in cross-gen casual mobile games. Supergiant, developer of top indie titles, including Hades. Supergiant, if Xbox wasn't in the position they are in right now, I would have loved to have seen them actually get Supergiant. They did kind of seem like they had a really good relationship with them, with like how Game Pass did and and... and I would have loved a PlayStation like acquisition of Supergiant where they like really like they work with them. They get Hades 2 on their platform and they really like it and then they get them into the studio. But that is not what Xbox is. Niantic, very strong technological infrastructure focused on XR and innovative mobile experience. We talked about Niantic earlier. They could probably get them for incredibly cheap right now, <laughs> which is very funny. Uh, Play Rick, strong franchise and content breath, world class in designing, making and running successful games. The exact same thing replies to the next company, which is Zynga. Of course, I've already been purchased uh, earlier uh, in 2021, right? No, it, wasn't. it was early in 2022, sorry. And the next gap is engagement and social interaction. Also an audience page. Which is probably the most interesting thing. So there's two things on here that make you go, wow. So Bungie, owner of AAA franchises with established ability to ship and scale games. Of course, no need for introduction of Bungie. Also, they have a prior relationship with Microsoft. I'd be interested if they would even accept the offer if they were given it. IO Interactive uh, has the exact same thing, except they have specialized expertise in regional IP game launches. Of course, IO Interactive, IO is what they're called in a lot. Known for the Hitman game they're about to release, James Bond. Gopely, very strong tech infrastructure to support non-owned IP opportunity to complement Xbox Games Studios IP. I don't actually know who Scopely is. So let's let's find that out together. A play through to it. Play every day. Let's see. Seize the play. Looks like a lot of mobile random things are games. There we go. Monopoly Go, Stumble Guys, yeah, yeah, Star Trek, Marvel Strike Force, Scrabble Go, W, yeah, they make a lot of mobile stuff, yeah. So, eh, interesting to get a little peek into their thought process. There's actually more, uh, if if that's even possible. There's even more. So there's more as behavior interactive are on here. People can fly housemark remedy entertainment. I don't know why they didn't scoop up remedy. It's funny that I would probably, I know, I know Activision is such a, and I'm going to ramble a little bit. Activision is such a compelling target. I would almost rather them not spend that money. And this is something that I've kind of turned around on. I would rather them just not spend how much money they're spending on, Activision and just go buy the small people and invest in your own studios, right? Use it to garner talent, use it to get people to come to you and not go to people unless maybe that is something that they kept trying, but I I, I didn't see the fruits of it, so I highly doubt they did. But why don't we uh, why doesn't I said I was about to say we very grossly. Sorry about that. What is an Xbox and Microsoft own remedy? Right? Why, why don't they why, why don't they go and really fleece and really work with these studios who who do really really impressive things super giant and they really said them out was like hey you know this is how we'll work and we get you like that and instead of going like you were just buying the big guys we're gonna buy Bethesda and we're gonna buy boom Activision Blizzard King it just seems so interesting to really and we're going to talk about a very, very damning Jim Ryan email in a little bit. Uh, more and more. So these are developers. Behavior Interactive. People Can Fly. Housemark. Remedy Entertainment. Developers. Self-published developers. 11 Byte Studios. 
Bohemia Interactive, Bungie, Crytek, IO Interactive, Larian Studios, Magicore Games, Play Dead, Rebellion Developments, Thunderful, and Supergiant Games. And a couple publishers, Paradox Interactive and Sega, shockingly enough. Uh, Sega, to me, would have only been interesting when they bought Atlas. Once they bought Atlas, I would have been like, okay, we can talk now. Let's, let's see if we buy Sega. Um, but it really goes to show you that they're just going to buy anyone. Right. Like they have all they have just laundry lists of people like, yeah, you know, we might buy these people. We might buy this and this and this and this and this. And there's even more, believe it or not. There's a bigger list here in a little bit. Yeah, here it is. Eleven plus companies sourced through Xbox Game Pass data, top 25 studios uh, by Steam set. So they just have a big list of. uh, Publishers and then and um, uh, developers that they just have like a just a huge list that they just go down and it's like do you guys give any thought to this stuff like it just looks like you're like just gonna try and buy them right like just buy everything it's kind of sad again as a again i'm an xbox fan but when you really see it all written down and it's that long goes like are you guys even thinking about some of this stuff you're just buying stuff like did you ever think about like what works and like and like how you can complement other things or how you can use one to help with others? There's a did I get that, Jim Ryan? Because actually, it's a very good thing to bring up right now. Uh, this should be it. Yeah. So this is January twenty 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 uh, January twentieth twenty twenty two. This is of course around the time they uh, announced the Activision Blizzard purchase. Uh, this is from Jim Ryan. It's not an Xbox exclusivity play at all. They're thinking bigger than that, and they have the cash to make moves like this. I've spent a fair bit of time with both Phil and Bobby over the past day. I'm pretty sure we will continue to see Call of Duty on PlayStation for many years to come. We have some good stuff cooking. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm not complacent, and I'd rather this hadn't happened, but we'll be okay. More than okay. Phil Spencer was in a CNBC... Uh, this is. Oh, I'm sorry. This is from... Uh, wait, no, is this, but King sold the major cash out and more talent. Yeah. Okay. This is what, uh, another thing I wanted. So that actually shows Jim Ryan, not really caring that the thing would go away, but this is from the same day, right? No, this is from the previous day. This is from Chris Deering to Jim Ryan, uh, January 19th, 2022, uh, Microsoft acquisition of, of, of Microsoft acquisition of Activision. Phil Spencer was in CNBC saying that the acquisition would submit Microsoft as a player in mobile games. Strike me more as a King play more than Call of Duty. But King sold to Bobby for $5 billion and has now grown to be worth $50 billion, uh, which $5 billion in USD is worth $50 billion in Euro, I believe. If it was an Xbox exclusivity play, Spencer could have locked up Microsoft console exclusively for the next co three COD releases for maybe $5 billion Euro. The major cash out will lure most of the talent to take the money and run as fast as their contracts will allow, leaving Microsoft with very gnarly management challenges. I bet Yves is smiling like a Cheshire cat. Speaking of, I assume of Yves Gilmont. If this was a play to end run PS5, etc., I think it is massively overvalued and will not meaningfully exceed. I guess Microsoft can piss away that kind of valuation without being more harmed than helped. But I am not losing a wink of sleep over the future for our baby. Hope you agree. Cheers, Chris. P.S. They would have been better off announcing a new electric car. Pretty serious stuff. And it really goes to show you that they just do not like each other, right? High executives do not like Xbox. PlayStation execs do not like Microsoft executives, same thing to Microsoft executives, probably don't like them because of all these things coming out. Uh, a lot of interesting things there. I actually think one thing that he said that I have thought for quite a while, and it is interesting to see someone that high up and someone that smart say say this. The major cash out will lure most of the talent to take the money and run as fast as their contracts will allow leaving Microsoft with very gnarly management challenge. What is one thing that everyone says Microsoft 
already, Microsoft being Xbox, already has a problem with? Management. What can they already, with the 20-something devs they already have, not do? It's 23, right? It's a 32. I feel like I mix those up. Not important. It, 20 plus. They already are struggling to management manage all these studios. So this does put them, if this goes through, which would be seen as a win for Microsoft, right? Might actually be a loss down the road. All these people with a giant cash out, they are overpaying, remind you. We uh, once they uh, once we reported on this purchase back in 2021, or sorry, 2022. Once the purchase happened, or is oh sorry, it didn't happen. Got announced to happen. The they were already overpaying by a lot. Um, I want to say it was by ten plus share price or something. It might have been more than that because I think they were valued at forty five and they were paying seven sixty five or so. I can't remember. That is massive amount of money overpay. I that is extraordinary. And what's funny is they could probably get more money now. I'm very curious if they stopped, if they could re like like I wonder if Kodak could renegotiate if he would like raise the price. Probably would right because they've only done more right. And also the giant. I don't know. That's a fun thought experiment. Would Kodak stop everything if he could and renovate? I guess he would all, wouldn't you all? I don't know. Would he be happy to be getting out? He doesn't really, he didn't really seem phased by like the harassments and, and, and these lawsuits and then like he, didn't, he never seemed to phase or care. He, he kind of seemed like he would make fun of them half the time. And let's not forget, he did threaten to kill Oldman. And uh, <laughs> so like uh, a lot of very interesting, crazy things that man has done. I'd be curious if you think he can get it for more now. I completely derailed. What was I even talking about? I was talking about, oh, um, yeah, so them being able to piss away the valuation of these things. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft can definitely do that. Microsoft can 100% say, yeah, we'll overpay this and make it back in a year. They'll make this money back almost immediately. This company makes like 200 plus billion dollars a year or something like that. Like it, no, we're talking about a nuts amount of money. I'd have to look up for like... The actual up-to-date numbers but this the company it's this is the amount of money that is so, is so in, crazy that it's hard to comprehend how much money they even have but when they have this evaluation play and, and uh jim ryan knows that this is not a play for exclusivity they don't care they want uh they see we have some good stuff Saying that it was it would cement a player in the game it strikes me more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was saying like more as a king playing these things. It's quite interesting to see Jim Ryan just be like, yeah, no, we never don't think it's leaving anytime soon. Again, I, I think there is a reality where Microsoft pulls Call of Duty. Technically, they needed uh, like we knew the this year was the last Call of Duty for the agreement that Activision had with PlayStation. So it was f it from here on, it's it's up to them to re to renew it, which they know they would. They would always renew the deal for another 10. It's just too there's too they need to make the money back. I think I've said all I've wanted to about this specific point, but th there's I don't know. My mind has so many thoughts. I'm hard, I'm having trouble piecing them all out, but. I wanted to really cement the major cash out where learn most of the talent away. I actually think that is a possibility. Uh, not even a possibility. I, that will happen. So they have to have a readiness to have a solution because they already struggle with this. They already are having trouble managing them. Look at Bethesda. We're going to talk about them a lot in a second. Uh, shocking. Look at Bethesda. They already are having problems with them with Redfall, and they already are very hands-off with what they do. Very hands-off. They've said that themselves, that where they actually might be too hands-off, which how are you not involved in, in, in a way to help them get these games out or assist them in development in these things? This is, it seems like, 
it's crazy to me that you're able to kind of mess this up. Why are we not helping? Why is there not like more of an ingrained kind of cohesion amongst the studios? It actually seems like there might be the opposite of that. And they're just like legs uh, separating from like, like the head of Microsoft at, instead of a web or something. I'm, I'm going everywhere here. Uh, so let's go on to, uh, this is a quick one. Iowa interactive project dragoon is going to be an Xbox exclusive. This was a, a thing that came out from the FTC hearing. This was an email published by the discovery shows that the Iowa interactive project dragon will be Xbox exclusive. Uh, I'll quickly read. Um, let's see here. So they have a full thing. It's, it's, uh, Iowa interactive ANS. Let's see here. Yeah, so they have like a whole detail of like, you know, what's the overview when it was founded in 1998 in Copenhagen. It has around 117 people. They have the strategies, the risk, additional information. They have all of these uh, expected release and previously shipped games versions. So it's funny they don't have a, a release for Project 007 or the Project Dragoon. But for Project 007, TBD, of course, is released. It will be a shooter genre. And then the platforms will be to be determined for, for double, uh, 007. But the Project Dragon, for it's a TBD, PC, Xbox Series, SNX, RPG shooter. So we will be getting an hour interactive title at some point in the future. I would assume it's releasing after James the James Bond game. Because just the way I would assume how this works, because they were currently working on the 007 now. So you would expect this later. But, um, that would be, that is interesting that we are seeing a exclusive game third party, not purchased, although they are on a lot of on the look purchasing, uh, you know, pages of all the ones they say they're there like three times. They are testing the waters. Maybe I'm curious if this will result in a full on. All right, Jeevers, I'm back. We're talking more FTC. And with this one, it is specifically Team Ninja's purchase in 2020. It was unveiled that Microsoft paid one hundred and seventeen million dollars for Ninja Theory in 2020. And they purchased them. Now, this is interesting because you can think about it a couple ways. That's not a lot of money. Especially when we look at Ninja Theory's past, but they have not made huge games. So let's go over. Let's go over some games they developed. So of course they are founded in I want I want to say 2001, 2001? Two, 2000, and they go and make Kung Fu Chaos in 2003, Heavenly Sword, which was an actually a game that a lot of people liked. Uh, that was a, that was a PS3 exclusive, and um, the previous game was exclusive to Xbox as well. Then they made Enslaved Odyssey to the West. Uh, that was a 360 PS3 game. People apparently really loved that. Apparently it was super underrated. I remember a bunch of people talking about how much they liked it. Uh, and it cool. I never tried any of these games, but I always hear that these are uh, seminal games. Uh, the, the DMC remake, Devil May Cry. I liked that a lot. I understand why didn't why people didn't like it. I get it. I think that game got way too much hate personally uh, because it wasn't there, Dante, and, you know, it was a reimagining. I thought it was cool. I really liked the ending, too. I know that's not very popular, but that was, of course, in 2013. Uh, Fight Back on iOS, so I, they made some, um, you know, mobile games. They helped make Disney Infinity Marvel Superheroes, which was the, of course, Disney Infinity, like, I don't know. DMC De uh, Definitive Edition 2015, they brought that to the current gen systems at the time. Disney Infinity 3.0, they uh, helped make that game. Uh, Dexed in 2017, and then of course in Hellblade was released as well in 2017. Nico Demon of Evanishment? Ev ev oh my god. And then Hellblade to No Sacrifice. I have to, I have to be honest here. Uh, I didn't know it had a VR. This was specifically for PC. I had no idea there was a VR game for Hellblade. 
Bleeding Edge, which came and died in 2020, and they were purchased that around that time too. They were purchased, I believe, before Bleeding Edge came out. I want to say, uh, wow, <laughs> that was a game that came out was dead on arrival. Similar to, of course, um, oh, what was that game that came out like right around Overwatch? Oh my god, it was like Blood something. I think it's not important. It wasn't Bleeding Edge, though. It was something else. Uh, and then, of course, as Hayabusa 2 and Project Mara are set to come out at some point. So they they got that for pretty cheap, especially given a pretty talented team. They had some people that were knowing what they're doing on the uh, um there. Now, of course, uh, give it a few years and they'll probably lose some of that talent, but they might be able to retain some of it. In Ninja Theory, I don't know. I like uh, Ninja Theory was always someone I liked that they bought because Ninja Theory makes different games, especially if you look at Hellblade and and their past games with Enslaved and these things. Although, of course, that was ten years ago. Are the do they still have that in them? I think they do, but I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up as we have more context for it now. Although they haven't released a game, like a big game yet, for Xbox. All right, Steven Tatillo always makes these great threads. This is the third day thread. We already covered the other two uh, for the majority of them. Uh, we're all going to quickly go through some of these. Not all of them are. Uh, for instance, Jim Ryan, this is when he does. The third day is when Jim Ryan came on. Uh, for a disposition, but it was pre-recorded. So they played the pre-recorded thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jim Ryan says he had expected Starfield and Elder Scrolls to launch on PlayStation because prior ZMX games had launched on multiple consoles. That confirms uh, that the Deathloop and Ghostwire were timed exclusives. Uh, Ryan now talking about how Sony collaborated with outside development partners, including Activision and developing tech for PS5 specifically, says Activision helped with PS5 haptic controllers. As one in filings uh, says, Sony should not share such advanced info if Microsoft bought Activision. And if uh, I don't know if anyone else saw this, but that was a lot of the talk where they're, they're pretty much saying, like, if you buy Activision, you are not seeing PS6 dev kits. Uh, you are not getting any of our information uh for anything upcoming of course winking at like the pro system and these things so yeah i i mean of course i don't necessarily blame them for saying that that does put activision in a tough spot to make the same gen game uh perfectly because you can't tried on a dev kit so i'm curious if that is them stretching the truth or they're just saying that because it's almost a win lose right so let's say activision gets dev kits for the ps6 right in this scenario and they theorize that in 2028 the new gen consoles would come out not crazy that's eight years that's almost a standard life cycle I think that's slightly on the longer side by like a year. No, it doesn't matter though. Not nearly as long as 360 and PS3, which was like 10 years. Um, but it's a win-lose, right? You give them the PS6 dev kits, but you're also telling uh, Microsoft the exact specifications of your PS6. Now, maybe I'm crazy, but I feel like they both know what the other ones are doing to some degree right because people talk i'm reminded of richard hogue which is a cr incredible channel by the way uh, he's a lawyer that specializes in merging and acquisitions actually so this is his field if you ever want to check him out go to his twitter he actually suffered a stroke recently so he hasn't been doing videos i i wish him well and i i love that guy so and it seems like he's doing better so but this is something he's actually said previously where people talk. He he was he told me um told me Jesus. He told in a video 
about a time where he had to help out a rival, uh, you know, rival in quotes, kind of, uh, lawyer, lawyer firm, lawyer, uh, law firm. And he helped him for a little bit, came back, and the moment he sat down to his test, yeah, I started like that. Yeah, let's just say a week. I don't remember the specifics of the story. Let's say, like, he helped him for a week and then came back. He helps him for a week, comes back. The moment he sits at his desk, he gets a call from his boss to say, hey, can you meet me in your office? So he's already sat down, gets a call. He's like, okay, I'm coming. Go sit down. He sits down. He's like, okay, so how was it over there? Like, and that's just a law firm that is not giant tech companies. I'm not saying they're inviting Phil over there. I'm not saying they're inviting Sarah Bond. It's not, you know, it's not one-to-one comparisons. But do you have a friend of a friend that knows Yo, this is what it is. This is what it looks like. This is, how, you know, how much. I don't know. And also, let's not say it doesn't work the other way. Did does do they not fully, pretty much know what the other one's revealing? Maybe I'm thinking too, um, fantastically, you know, fantastically or something like. Maybe it doesn't quite work that way. But I don't know. I I'm always surprised when one or someone pretends like they don't know everything i just imagine that just through tea leaves and and like discussions like i'm not shocked if they didn't know like the full-on working of of the dual sense for instance but they have a general idea of like yeah they're making this controller that apparently is responsive to like certain commands in the game like you know something like that i'm like historically i do rambling but I don't know. I find I found that interesting, and they aren't. I I actually believe Sony when they say like we're not giving you dev kits, but that does give them a tough situation that they then can't make the previous promise, which pretty much he was like he wants both games released on there with the exact same. Not one is better on another system or anything like that. They want it equal. You can't really do that if you don't have your dev kits to make on the PS6. So. I don't know, and he also brought up why Minecraft wasn't uh, launched on the PS5, which I believe still isn't, and that's for the same reason they weren't given dev kits uh, for the for Minecraft, so they're not they're not doing it. And I'm like, okay, but like, why isn't it on there now? Right? Because let, let me make sure I'm not talking on my ass, please. Is there a PlayStation Five Minecraft? Is there? There definitely is an Xbox Series X Minecraft. Yeah. I don't think there is. Yeah, I think it's just... Your, I think the people are still playing the... PlayStation 4 Minecraft game. Yeah. So I'm not crazy there. Moving on. Let's see. Anything else interesting? Oh, here's one. Um, So Jim Ryan says this. Uh, Jim Ryan says he has no problem with exclusives as a differentiating factor. Um, He's asked the question, did he mind Redfall went exclusive? I don't like it, but I have fundamentally have no quarrel with it. Interesting way of putting that. Starfield. I don't like it, but I don't view it as anti-competitive. Interesting way of putting this. I think this was kind of the most popular exchange from this specific day that was given out i don't i don't really read into it too much because he is pretty clear um it is pretty clear what jim ryan is saying right like he doesn't see it as anti-competitive and he has no quarrel with redfall being changed to an exclusive right like he doesn't like it and he's and he's making sure he does say the very very specific situation of I don't like it, right? Saying like he's not saying like he doesn't think it's good or anything. He's just saying I personally don't like it, although again, he doesn't bring up that he does the same thing. So quite interesting that it's hard to take Jim Ryan to anything because PlayStation does this. So it's hard to care when he when they say these things. I think that's about it that I wanted to cover. Because um, Stephen Till did such a good job. If you guys want a full, pretty much, breakdown 
of each day. He did a full th thread for all of it, which is very cool. Very, very cool. And some of this is not given the love that it needs to be. But that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, a big argument was that Microsoft argues cloud is in its own market and it's directly tied to gaming in general. So the argument pretty much that the CMA had was we can't, we have to block the deal because if this goes through, this put cloud back by a lot for newer companies. And the issue is if this happens, this could kill the market for cloud in like the next 10 to 20 years, you know, whatever. Like no one could pretty much enter the service. They're arguing the opposite being no cloud is a very niche gaming related thing. It isn't like a market where like there's going to be a cloud market where in a few years, like Netflix and all these things are doing all this stuff. It's, it's going to be a very niche market and things. And they bring up Microsoft argues cloud is an in market notable on Thursday. Xbox's Sarah Bond said Microsoft recently abandoned plans to offer a standalone Xbox cloud service. A change since a recent deposition that she attributed to a sp strategy shift and consumer interest. So they abandoned plans for a standalone Xbox cloud service. They were going to straight up do X cloud, which we kind of saw that through the browser kind of thing they have but they i mean that's a good point that they bring up like i mean we aren't doing it now uh which kind of tells us that they're abandoning x cloud in the in the literal sense of like there probably won't be a app on a tv unless it you know obviously separate from like the samsung thing but i thought that was quite interesting as well uh let's see And then there's some other things. So that's everything from day three for sure. Let's go back. Uh, this made the rounds a lot, but people were not reading. And also the headline was very misleading as well. So the Project Q price point was revealed by the Microsoft FTC filing. Now, it wasn't quite, but it was at the same time. So pretty much the, the filing was uh, brought up that this device is going to be under $300, and that's all we know, right? People took it as it's 300 bucks. Don't know why, because you could just read it, but they did. And the headline went, and uh, I forget who ran with it first, if I'm being honest. I'm not going to say who it was, just in case. I, I don't know. It might have been DeSecto um, or something. I don't know, but I might be wrong. I, I shouldn't have even said the name, because I don't remember. But that was... Telling because everyone immediately turned on this thing saying like that's way too expensive for a thing. Now, I, I have no horse in this Project Q race, so I don't really care. So I feel like I'm just going to move on because I don't think I I've already said my piece. This thing isn't for me because I have a phone already. So why do I need this thing if it's good? And like really good, I'll buy it. But if it's literally just for remote play and all it is is, hey, there's a PS dual sense on it. Like, I don't really care. I don't know. Again, like not important. I'm moving on. We've got to cover that email. Um, yes. So I want to bring this up now. My link doesn't work for some reason. So the the original link might have died. So let's see, Sony says publishers hate game pass and it, and again this is under oath i don't know if anyone saw this let's just read from this GameSpot article i don't know if people saw this so he was he's under oath here so the, so I, I understand if people is like well you know maybe you're more of an xbox fan like i am but you don't understand the uh legalities so this isn't like lying like to a person you have to remind yourself, this is under oath, right? This is law, right? You get in very, and people do, you can look it up. People get in very, very, very large amount of trouble if you lie under oath. You're breaking the law if that happens, right? I want to make sure that's clear because it's it's an, there's obvious doubt when it comes from who it's coming from and what it's specifically saying. 
I understand if you hear this article and be like, he's just lying. If he was caught lying, like in a company email, if let's say something happens in, to Sony in four years and they have to do an FTC hearing or something and discovery happens, meaning they have to give you all their emails from the last 10 years and they have to piece through it and find stuff, you can get a lot of trouble, as in large fines, going to jail. So this is not something to really trifle with. So when he says what he's about, when I'm about to read out to you, and I'm sure many people read about this, it paints a light that I've something I've kind of come around to. That maybe Game Pass is not the best. Now I'm going to be taking a sip, so make sure everyone at home takes a sip. As I like taking sips with everyone else. It's kind of like a calming thing that we can all do. We can get ready for the rest of this video, and we can clear our minds a bit. All right, so let's take that sip. Ah, it's good stuff. All right. GameSpot, Luis Joshua Gutierrez. Love it. Now... According to PlayStation boss Jim Ryan's deposition, this is via The Verge, he claims to have talked, he, he, sorry, back up. He claims to have, quote, talked to all publishers. They unanimously do not like Game Pass because it's value destructive. Ryan then go, continues to say this opinion is, quote, very commonly held view by publishers, end quote. And he doesn't believe that Call of Duty would be on Game Pass if the ac acquisition isn't approved, which is actually something we do know because Bobby Kotick will take the stand very soon. We'll cover that. Uh, quote, I also think it hurts sales because a lot of people just go in and try it and they don't invest. If they don't like the first 10 minutes, that's it. Also, if you don't make the first 10 minutes amazing, maybe it's a problem. I think Game Pass is OK. It's not my favorite. My favorite is the old premium model where I sell you on some video on big images and earn your $30, and then after that, I have to deliver. I don't need to get money out of you later, end quote. Oh, oh wow, I messed that up. I th That is from, sorry, this is from the Summer uh, Somerville devs, uh, which might be the most interesting part of uh, one of the more interesting ones because they went on the record. So that that's the jump ship. Um, and he's a former Somerville dev. He actually said that. Let, let's see, Pat. What's his name or her name? I don't. I don't know. Dino Patty. The city originally pitched the game to Google Stadia. Lol. But end up partnering with Microsoft. Yeah, 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 in the interview. Yeah, I think it hurts sales. Yeah. So that's one record saying a publisher hates it right the somerville which sucks because I, I thought that was like a perfect game pass game if i'm being honest where it's like a like a very narrative field thing i'm not gonna bore you guys with with some of it right now but going back to jim ryan um yeah very common very commonly held by publishers we already know straw is out nick we actually covered this oh was it in may or march and straw Zelnick had that big interview with like yahoo or whoever that was where we read that Wherever he had that, that reminds me of, of the straw selling talk where he's just like subscription versus straight up do not work in our industry because it's just it's not the same thing. He doesn't see how it would work, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have close to on the record Jim Ryan and he's saying other publishers just don't like it and it's value destructive. Hard to say he's saying anything wrong here. Again, I am a fan of Game Pass. I have subscribed to it. I am paying the money for Game Pass. I want to make all of this clear. I am one of the people who is paying for it, so I definitely can be the one to tell you that, yeah, he's probably right. I actually have kind of turned my back to Game Pass in a way that I'm saying... A few things. One, Game Pass is a great service. It's insane to the point where you have to own it if you have an Xbox. I really don't understand why you wouldn't just pay monthly. But the, all those things can be true, right? I can also think it's value destructive, but I also think everyone should have it. Because it's insane value to the point where it's, it's, it's insane if you don't have it. 
So you should have it. You should you should own it. You should own Game Pass. I think everyone with an Xbox should. But I, it might be hurting the overall store for games. Now, I can't imagine the I, I can't imagine everyone buying games on, on Xbox now, right? If you have this service, you really have to wow somebody to be able to buy their game. No one's really buying their game because because, uh, you know, you have like the Game Pass option. Now you have the the option of like, oh, it might come to Game Pass. Now, I don't think this will destroy the entire economy of games, right? Because I always bring up like Netflix exists. Now, these aren't the same things. And also, we're seeing the streaming services kind of starting to suck a little bit, in my opinion, but that's not important. And also, everyone complains that all their favorite Netflix shows get canceled, which I'm like, okay, but would they, I don't know. Are they canceling things that aren't popular? That's also another thing that we could talk about some other time. Um, this should just be a whole video by itself. Uh, Game Pass is destructive in some way. I don't know. I think there's a good discussion there to be had. I think it's I think it's a very complicated thing to talk about because clearly, obviously, it makes them no money. They're actually bleeding a lot of money, and Game Pass is set up to there is no going back necessarily. They can't really turn this ship around. There isn't like a well, well. Well, Game Pass doesn't work out, so we have to do this now. I don't think that's going to happen, but that also makes people not care about selling the games on Game Pass because it kills the, the sales that they were getting. And also, like they are happily saying on the FTC hearings, they're in third place. Their console share is very, 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 very small. They were already selling less than the three big ones, right? Or the out of the big three, they were already not selling a lot of it, right? So when you add something like Game Pass to it, you further erode the little sales that you're already doing. Now, I'm not talking about the big games. Those are always going to sell, but maybe that middle range or maybe the lower range. I'm not sh honestly sure what range it hurts the most out of the entire game economy of sales, etc. Like, is it hurting the mid range more? Is it hurting the indies more? I imagine it might be spread across the entire bow. Everything at the top end doesn't really get affected, but the middle and lower end it probably will because, you know... I'm just going to wait for it to come to Game Pass might happen or something. And that doesn't quite work the same way, maybe. I don't know. It, hmm. It's hard. It's hard because we don't really know how Game Pass is paid, right? Like, how much are they getting paid for this? Can a game be saved if it comes to Game Pass later? Like, let's say I'm just going to make it up an example. Um, Hades. I don't know. Let's just say it's Hades. Let's say Hades didn't do great, right? Let's say Hades launched, doesn't do great. It's a great game, but doesn't get discovered, maybe. I, again, I don't even... I think this is a bad scenario, but let's let's stick with it. Let's say Hades is a great game, but doesn't get founded. I don't think that really happens, but let's just say it. I wonder if the game, the money that they would be getting from Game Pass after it launches would save and make the game profitable. I have to imagine no. Um, now, and that's again, this scenario is really bad because that game was very expensive to make, and it, it's it's not like an indie game where it, it costs a million dollars or something like very very insignificant amount of money in the grand scheme of things, um, or maybe you know eight, eight in the high hundreds of thousands. So a Game Pass deal would get them in the green probably very fast. But this is something I would love to have a discussion with somebody because Game Pass is such a complicated beast to discuss. You have to. We don't know the numbers, which you have to imagine is not changing and it's stagnating because they're not telling you the numbers. Uh, Phil Spencer's has already said that pretty much verbatim that. Yeah, no, Game Pass um, is not growing. That's why we're switching to PC. He said that in an interview before, actually. So we're kind of, they're kind of shifting their their thought process to PC gaming. Or sorry, their Game Pass focus to PC trying to get some of the PC market. Good luck. They're all on Steam, and they get really angry if anything else tries to mess with their monopoly. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how how well Game Pass on PC would do. Although I think it would be a compelling service as well. 
I just think it's just not enough. I don't know. I've always said this Game Pass just is not enough money. When it increased, I remember telling everybody, it's like, yeah, I would pay more than this. So this is nothing to me. Game Pass is insane value. Like 20 bucks a month to me is incredibly reasonable, right? 20 times 12, $240. You and games are now 70 bucks. So if you play four games at full price, that's enough. That's all you have to do for the whole year. Or three games in like one indie. That's like 40 or 50. So I think it should be more. I think the problem probably lies with he's saying it's value destructive. Yeah, I don't I don't think I necessarily disagree. This experiment, I'm curious again where it ends. What is the end goal? Is it, it and and is it a better marketplace for gaming when when it ends? Cuz right now I don't see how it works for publishers. We're already seeing people just Square Enix is pretty much abandoned Xbox almost. Is that like the beginning? Is that like where it's going to start? I don't know. I I would have said, uh, like, you know, a couple years ago, I wouldn't have said Square Enix would just not care about Xbox after a while. I know they're not big in Japan, and, and it's not quite the same thing. Sorry about that. But still, I don't know. It's pretty insane. Back again. Again, this was very long in the making, so I apologize that I have to step away so much. Okay, let's see. We already covered... Oh, my God. Did we cover this? I don't think we did. So... We covered some of the bad redactions from the specifically the Call of Duty one, I believe. But we did not talk about fully the PlayStation one, which was very funny. So, again, as a reminder, um, PlayStation redacted things. It looks like they either didn't know or didn't understand. They just blacked it out with regular Sharpie. That doesn't work when you uh, upload images through like a copier or something. So you can clearly still see the the wording. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we now know, uh, and this is what the the full thing, I'll just read the whole thing, actually. Developing and producing AAA games often cost over $100 million, requires hundreds of thousands of developers, and takes years. For instance, development of Horizon Forbidden West, a 2020, a 2022 uh, Sony Interactive first party release, lasted a total of, I think that says five years. So let's just get the actual um, thing out. Let's see. Uh, Sony... All right, so Horizon Forbidden West clocked in around $212 to develop with a staff of over 300. The Last of Us Part uh, 2 was around $220 million to make with roughly 200 employees at the PK count. Uh, and then there's also some other things uh, specifically about PlayStation that over 1 million PlayStation players only play Call of Duty. So they literally have a machine that just plays Call of Duty for them. Let's see here. And there were some other ones I wanted to read. Yeah, it was this. Okay. And yeah, so in 2022, over 100 million players, uh, PlayStation players only played Call of Duty on their PlayStation and nothing else. Six million PlayStation players spent 70 percent of their time only playing Call of Duty. That is quite interesting. So a combined total of 700 million players. That's regular active players, assumably uh, in Call of Duty. And they might, eh, no, I don't know. That's presumptuous, I guess I would say. Because they're not necessarily fully active. They are just. Spent plays, spent. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't say how active they are. Because hmm. obviously there's people who just turn it on to play Call of Duty, but right, they, they're definitely seeing a, this bare minimum, this many players play Call of Duty just, just for this. So. That is a sizable loss. And again, they make a lot of money off of a game that they do not have to do anything for. That is many of the reason why they do not want to lose 
Call of Duty on PlayStation because it is free money. Elsewhere, Call of Duty players spent an average of 116 hours a year playing Call of Duty. The big one is that Call of Duty is worth $800 million to Sony in the U.S. alone, with a global price of $1.5 billion. Bundling this with players spending on PlayStation hardware and subscriptions, it could be worth anywhere close to something as high as $15.9 billion a year. I mean, this is insanity, right? This is why they can't really... I mean, afford is a strong word. They don't want to lose it. They're generating hilarious amount of income for something they have to do nothing for. That is something that really drives the marketplaces of a lot of these people, right? That 730 split. The big games, they get that big cut, especially when we're contributing microtransactions to the case, of course. Right? Microtransactions, you're getting a cut from every 730. I mean, Fortnite is a great example, right? You're getting all that money from... God, my hair is having a bad day today, isn't it? it looks terrible. I'm sorry, video, listen- or video listeners, these are video watchers. It looks god-awful. But I wanted to qu- uh, quickly bring up that if you are wondering why they're fighting so hard to keep Call of Duty, uh, that is a lot of money. And again, they don't have to do any of it. And if Xbox gets it, uh, there is no guarantee that it stays there forever. Maybe 10 or 20 years it goes away, but it could go away. Uh, Just as a fun one, almost half of PS5 owners own a Switch. One in five PlayStation own an Xbox. Just cool. Just cool. I I saw that. Um, I don't remember where I saw that, but I saw that somewhere. I wanted to write that down. Uh, and then here's day five of Steven Still's little thing. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over one of the a couple of these that I find interesting. Today is the Amy Hood testimony, which is the CFO for Microsoft. And then also Tim Stewart, I believe, is also doing it. Yeah, they had to. So uh, during all this happened, the Canadian uh, competition regulator sent Microsoft lawyers a factual inaccuracies in Microsoft Activision court filing. Says it's not just UK concerned about the deal. Says it's concluded deal would substantially lessen competition in consoles, subs, and cloud. Uh, it's funny because the Microsoft literally was like, "Hey, the uh, the period to do any of this is past." So they pretty much ignored them, which was pretty funny. Uh, I assume that's the equivalent of an email saying, "Sorry, you're late to this," but I don't know. They pretty much just said, "Like, yeah, uh, too bad." Let's see. FTC lawyers discussing internal discussions by Microsoft execs, including about pulling all games made by Zenimax from PlayStation. We are uh, they covered that before. Uh, it's walking through some emails and running numbers. Yeah, so in which exa- we're running numbers to see how many Game Pass subs would be needed to make up for loss of revenue if PlayStation revenue declined because Activision games were in some way pulled from PlayStation. Interesting thought experiment. Wonder why. Stewart emphasizes this was a math experiment. Lots and lots of discussions of these models, though no indication that this was the plan. Microsoft lawyer gets Stewart to talk about value Microsoft placed in mobile expansion via Activision. The high value Microsoft has placed in Microsoft's multi-platform performance. In other words, of course, the view here is that Microsoft wants Activision for mobile, not to pull COD from PlayStation. Stewart is asked if it would make financial sense to take Call of Duty exclusive. He says that would make no sense. And that was pretty much everything from day five. Not nothing too crazy. That is done with that, and we're getting close to the end here. This is a little expert I wanted to read. So the uh, and this is one of the filings. The FTC's case fails at the start because Xbox does not have the ability or incentive to withhold Call of Duty from its competitors. It would economically irrational for Xbox to withhold Call of Duty from its competitors and regardless Xbox cannot do so. After agreeing to acquire Activision, Microsoft has entered in agreements to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo, which has not had Call of Duty on its consoles for over a decade, and to five leading cloud gaming services, which Activision has consistently refused to do for 10 years. It has made the same offer to Sony, which is guaranteed access to Call of Duty through at least 2024 under its currently operative agreements, committing to the public and shareholders and now to the court that it will continue to sell Call of Duty on Sony's PlayStation. But Sony refused to accept. Even if Microsoft somehow had both incentive and the ability to withhold Call of Duty from Sony, 
Doing so would not consist. Uh, yeah, consisted. Yeah, consist to it. Yeah, I'm sure that's an easy word that I'm messing up. A quote, substantial lessening of competition, end quote. Constitute, Jesus. I'm an idiot. The acquisition of a single game by a third place out of three console manufacturers cannot upend this highly competitive industry. Exclusive titles are a common method by which game platforms compete, and Sony and Nintendo both have vastly larger libraries of exclusive content than Xbox. Moreover, Call of Duty is not essential content for any platform, and the vast majority of gamers do not do not even play Call of Duty at all. Interesting way to put that. The FTC's theory of harm to the punitive markets for subscription library and cloud gaming services is even weaker. Neither service is a standalone market, but rather an emerging alternate to existing products in the game industry. Currently, Activision content is generally not available on either on subscription libraries or on cloud platforms, and Activision has no intention to make them available for an array of technological and financial reasons. Microsoft, by contrast, has entered binding contracts to bring uh, Activision content to its own subscription library and to third-party cloud gaming platforms. Thus, the undisputed evidence will show that across every punitive market identified by the FTC, the result of the merger will not output enhancing, meaning broader in access to Activision content and more competition. That's pretty much their outlining on multiple different ways of, look, we're going to bring this to everything. It wouldn't happen if we didn't buy them. This is pretty much the closing of everything I wanted to bring up. I do want to talk quickly about Bobby Kotick's side of things, as he might actually be the most interesting... The most interesting stand of all, I think. So let's discuss. This is from The Verge. This is where they did a lot of the write-ups uh, and got a lot of his information. So, we'll start from the top. Activision CEO Bobby Kotick was first to take the stand this morning, as I think this was the fourth day. Um, and, of course, he's well-known. Activision managed to create a Call of Duty game every year, something like that. We're playing as if it was based on Call of Duty. So, why isn't it? Okay. Uh, it's created in Call of Duty. Yeah, particularly new game EA. So, Activision managed to create a new Call of Duty game every year. Something that Sony has argued makes it a practically or particularly unique game EA's Medal of Honor inspired Call of Duty admitted to Kotick after quote people at Activision were playing it end quote as Call of Duty is based on conflicts and wars there's almost an endless supply of history to create yearly installments quote we had to instill a compensation and reward system to keep people motivated to work on sequels end quote interesting way of putting that we had to instill a compensation and reward system to keep people motivated because they even understand that I get it you're bored by this but Here's a sh ton of money, uh, and this will probably make it to where you don't care what you're working on. So they probably pay them a lot of money, and they don't care anymore. Very curious how deep the compensation and reward system goes. You would have a revolt if you were to remove a game from one platform. Gamers are incredibly passionate. You get invested in the experience. It's like a sport. That's one of his things, bringing up... Uh, <laughs> Uh, pretty much like, it. yeah, if, if it was taken away, it, it would be a big deal. Activision doesn't need to make Call of Duty exclusive because it leverages its publishing power in other ways. Sarah Bond, head of Xbox Creator Experience, testified last week that Microsoft, and we talked about this, had the revenue sharing deal. Kodak wanted Microsoft to agree to a new rev revenue sharing deal, literally just getting bullied into making a new deal. Uh, of course, 730 is the classical spit, and uh, they straight up just said, we don't want that anymore. It was, uh, quote, it was clear that Call of Duty would be on PlayStation 5, and that would not have been good if it was not also on Xbox, said Bond last week, of course. Activision also picks which platform is Call of Duty should be available on, and sometimes it picks badly. Quote, I made a bad judgment, end quote, says Kodak about not putting Call of Duty on Switch. Activision had to put Call of Duty on the Nintendo Wii previously because Kodak thought it was, quote, the most extraordinary video game sister Evan created, end quote. But he was less impressed with the Switch initially. Quote, I saw the prototype for the Switch, and I was concerned they were trying to accomplish a lot with the console, but also the portability, uh, the portable compatibility. I don't think it was going to be widely successful. And how'd that work out for Activision? It's probably the second most successful video game system of all time, says Kodak. Quote, so it was a bad decision on my behalf, end quote. Kodak also discussed Game Pass and how Activision isn't currently interested. This is uh, probably the most interesting part of the entire this is this is, uh, obviously the entire maybe the entire hearing quote i have a general aversion to the idea of multi-gaming subscription services 
says Kodak. Before saying putting games in a subscription service, quote, would degrade the economics, end quote. That sounds a lot, that sounds a lot like value destructive comment that Jim Ryan said was a common opinion a hold. And of course, they akin that to what we covered earlier. The FTC was quick to push Kodak in on multiple game subscriptions, pointing out that Activision is the business of making games and has an incentive to put to be everywhere. Kodak argued that Activision had made a formal decision about not putting its games on subscriptions, and after a tense back and forth, he admitted there could be a strategic reason to offer content on game subscriptions, quote, for a small duration of time, but not something sustainable, end quote. All right, now I want to get more into that. Hold on. That didn't cover as much as I thought it did. Bobby Kodak. FTC here. See if someone has a better thing about his views. Let's steal the verge. This might be better. Ah, that's not good either. Give me a second. I'll cut all this out. Or maybe not. And I'll leave it for us to kind of mail over our decisions and let's see. All right, here we go. So Tech Raptor has a better one. Mentioned that the revenue was twice as yeah. So Kodak explained that Call of Duty has never been exclusive because Activision has always aimed to create games for many platforms. He would never want to make an exclusive franchise that has a hundred million monthly active users, half on smart devices, half on consoles, and there would be a roll if if a platform was removed from the picture. Kodak mentioned that the revenue on PlayStation twice is that on Xbox. It makes sense. As Sony brands and presence in different markets lets them have a disproportionate market share. The executive doesn't doubt Sony would manage to compete if the deal passes as they have an enormous development capacity and own some of the best studios in the world. According to Kodak, Microsoft never even discussed the idea of removing COD from PlayStation and always described it as multi-platform. Speaking of the possibility of intentionally degrading the games on PlayStation, Kodak explained that he has never heard of such an occurrence. He is also he has been opposed to the franchise on subscription services as he has a general aversion to the whole idea, partly due to seeing media companies moving their content to streaming uh, subscription services and having their business suffer. He also confirmed that COD or any other title would never appear on Game Pass without the deal with Microsoft, and he would never consider if the deal fell through. He also mentioned that the players paying 15 per month to play World of Warcraft, it would not make economic sense to put it on multi, uh, a multi-game subscription service. Asked whether he wants the deal to go through, he answered, quote, very much so, end quote, and added that 98% of Activision Blizzard shareholders voted in favor. Uh, question, but... I swear that he answered very much so. Question by the FTC's attorney, Kodak Reary, that Activision is, quote, platform agnostic and wants its games distributed as widely as possible and confirms there are no plans to launch games on multi-games subscription services. While Activision had games on PlayStation Plus, it was only for a small duration of time, of course. Asked whether it was formally... Blah, 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 skipping that. Let's just ask if we accepted it. Oh, here we go. Uh, uh, Judge Jacqueline Scott Corley herself asked Kodak why he accepted the acquisition since she thinks putting games on a multi-game subscription service doesn't make economic sense and he responded while he has a philosoph philosophical disagreement his response to be as a CEO to the shareholders the FTC questioned uh, Kodak on, on a document prepared for Activision COO for him with talking points for a discussion with NVIDIA after putting uh, Activision games on GeoForce Now but Kodak responded that said talking points were never used the regulator's attorney also attempted to poke holes in the perception of Activision Mobile development capabilities besides keen by highlighting the deals with Tencent and NetEase for Call of Duty Mobile and Diablo Immortal. Call, sorry, Call of Duty Mobile and Diablo Immortal. They also attempted to cast down, so blah, 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 cuts him in with cast considering. Yeah, Kaldic also mentioned that Activision would possibly consider putting Call of Duty on its own on a hypothetical next generation Nintendo consoles, but there are currently no plans to do so. It would depend on the specs. Ask whether he's confident that the would working together with the engineers will be able to deliver quality on Switch. He answered positively. Let's see here. Sure, I think that's everything I wanted to cover. There was a specific quote I was trying to find. Um, but we go to FC. Yeah, ninety-eight percent of the shareholders voted for this. Oh, let's see. 
I think that's everything if we were to move it. Yeah, reputation or damage. The hearing represents a major ten. Hustle run. Let's see. I think that's everything. Yeah. That's pretty much everything. He's pretty much saying, yeah, I don't like Game Pass, but uh, it's like, why did you agree to sell? The shareholders voted for it. That's why. I think that's everything. Let's randomly go through this. Make sure we scooped up everything. Uh, a triple A cost two. Yeah, plans is in fact worth a lot of money. Jim Ryan doesn't think is Anthony. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Starfield almost skipped Xbox entirely. Uh, the that was always the kind of hearsay that PlayStation was eyeballing Starfield. The whole reason they bought it was to make sure that didn't happen. Which is like, so you bought the entire studio. Be to make sure that they didn't get exclusive on the start. And I was like, okay, interesting. Um, I know we already covered it, but that Bethesda email is one of the... Wait, did we cover that? Yeah, we covered it. That was one of the first things we covered, right? Let me double check. Microsoft's here and quiet, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, P. Hines being very angry. That's That's probably my favorite thing out of all this. Did we talk about this? To be clear, I was surprised to see the bullet below. Pull the... Yeah, yeah, we covered that. The Eurosco 6 is a long ways off. Yeah, not shocking. No one, literally no one. Uh, of course, uh, this is a very quick one. Microsoft CEO Saudi Novell said he has no love for console exclusives. Of course, you don't, because not having exclusive is most beneficial to the person that's in third place. Uh, so why would you like it? It's not supporting. So yeah, that's pretty much everything. That's everything I want to talk about the FTC. This is probably one of the longest videos I've ever did solo. Uh, thank everyone for sticking along. This was very complicated. I had so many, I have so many emails on this thing. I can finally delete now. Uh, yeah, this is. Oh, and let's quickly talk about this. I think uh, Xbox has historically had lower operating margin than Microsoft's other lines of business. This is from Amy Amy Hood, I believe. This is still true today. Microsoft operating margin is approximately 40%. Then there's a giant redact. So I don't know what any of this says. Over time, we were striving to increase Xbox's operating margin to bring it closer to those of Microsoft's other lines of business. With approximately $16.23 in revenue in fiscal year 2022, Xbox is also a relatively small line of business within Microsoft, which is fucking hilarious to hear that. Whose annual revenue of the fiscal year of 2022... Again, this is revenue, so this isn't gross. Was approximately one hundred and ninety eight point two seven billion dollars. As a central component of that valuation was the reduction in forecasted total future sales of Activision's content on all platforms, including continued sales of Call of Duty on Sony's PlayStation. The possibility of making Call of Duty exclusive to the Xbox was never assessed or discussed with me nor was it even mentioned in any of the presentations to or discussions with the board of directors. I understood the necessity of keeping Call of Duty on other platforms. The acquisition, strategic rationale, and financial valuation are both aligned toward making Activision games more widely available, not less. Another important component of the fi financial analysis was that the purchase had to be financially accretive to, yeah, accretive to Microsoft's shareholders in year one meaning that the acquisition must immediately contribute to the increase in earnings per share. It's a much clearer way of describing they need to immediately see the increase in shares for this to be worth it. Which makes sense. This is a lot of money. Anyone who thinks Call of Duty is going exclusive is fucking crazy. It is not immediate. I'm not saying 10, 15 years from now. It's, it's, it's not exclusive. I'm just saying in the short term. Oh, and that's the FTC hearing in the nutshell. There's still a lot more I could have covered here, but that is the most interesting thing I think that I could bring to you guys. Let's get into date updates and get the hell out of here. Date updates, Stray coming to Xbox August 10th. Blade Runner 2033 Labyrinth was announced from Annapurna, their first in uh, the first uh, self-developed uh, game as well, of course, published. Coming to PC and consoles. 
It is set between the original field and Blade Runner 2049 and is the first internally developed game for Iron Race Event. What's queued up, of course? Sorry, I'm getting tired for this. What is queued up? This is, of course, the game, uh, a TV show, a movie, a comic book, a manga, really anything. What do you have queued up for the weekend? This is a question I have for you. What do you have queued up? I, of course, will just be playing Final Fantasy 16. I've continued to be playing Final Fantasy 16. I'm having a great time. I'm, uh, of course, playing Marvel Snap still. I'm addicted to that game. Dip my toes back into Destiny. To just cry. I like doing the seasonal things for like the free bright dust and stuff. So I'm doing that in the background, playing with some friends. But aside from that, that's pretty much it. I don't really have anything else to really uh, relate to anyone. I hope everyone's having a great day. Uh, start of their july hope everyone has a fun fourth of july of course make sure you are having plenty of fun have a nice maybe barbecue or something or 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 enjoy the outside i don't know have have fun though and that's all i have for you guys this week i will see you very soon i am glad or at least hoping that this comes to everybody and everyone's happy and healthy remember keep it locked here like comment subscribe share with a friend patreon.com slash achievers of course thank you so much and again until next time go achieve